Components are a pretty unique feature of Convex that I haven't seen any other backend platform do. They let you pull in pre-built, self-contained features directly into your own app. If you're asking yourself, how is that different from a library or NPM package? Then you'd be right to ask that because that's exactly the same question I had when I first encountered them. So even though you can install components from NPM, they aren't just little packages of logic. They're actually more like little self-contained Convex apps in their own right. They have their own little database and scheduler and all the Convex app things. They can even have their own components, which can have their own components, which can have their own components and so on. So they're really quite powerful as it means that common backend functionality can be written once and then shared between many different projects. So since the initial components launch over a year ago now, a bunch of first party components have been added to the components marketplace. Things like rate limiters, presence, aggregates, AI agents, and many more. There's also been a light sprinkling of third party components, such as Autumn, Dodo Payments, OSS Stats, etc. The number of third party components is low so far because the team has been taking it quite slow with the development of the components, making sure that they can get the API just right. And so up to now, component authoring was on an invite only alpha kind of status with very little in the way of documentation, examples, and guidance. Well, as of today, that all changes because now I'm excited to announce that component authoring is open to everyone. We have docs, examples, and brand new components from Stripe, Cloudflare, WorkOS, and more. And I'm super excited to take you through it all in this video. We're gonna build a simple component together, learn about some of the common patterns and important things you should be aware of when building your own component. Oh, and stick around to the end as I have a spicy take for components that you aren't gonna to wanna to miss. All right, so without further ado, once you drop me a like and sub and grab yourself a lovely cup of tea, let's get into it. All right, so first up, let's talk about the three types of components. They're kind of more like three different ways of writing components rather than three types. But anyway, first you have a sibling component. So these are components that are gonna live alongside your convex code inside your project. These are great for modularizing smaller parts of a larger project and are super quick to iterate on as we will see a little bit later. Then we have NPM packages. These are the, probably the type that you're most familiar with having installed components before from NPM. And this is probably what you would wanna go for if you wanted to share your component with the community. Finally, we have hybrid components which are kind of like a combination of sibling component and NPM components. You can install the components, but it gets installed into your convex folder directly, which means that you can then modify it to your own needs. The only component that I know that does this currently is the better auth component. And the reason it does it is because it's quite common for users to want to modify or um, customize their auth solution. So that's why the better auth component does that. But for today's video, we're gonna keep things quite simple and we're gonna build a sibling component together. Okay, so the first step is to start with a Convex app. It doesn't matter what kind of app, I'm gonna keep it simple and just go with Vite and no all for now. Once you've got that installed, you can run npm run dev and whiz through the setup steps. And once you've done that, you should have a blank Convex template where you can click this button, which pushes a random number into the database and then shows uh, this list of numbers here. Should be very familiar to you if you've done any sort of uh, convex from template project before. Okay, now let's get our hello world component going. So first let's create a new folder for our component. It needs to live at the same level as our convex directory and let's call it hello component. And in that directory, let's create a convex.config.ts file and pop some of this stuff in here. It basically tells Convex that well, this is going to be a component and it's going to be called hello component. Now I'm getting some ESLint warnings yelling at me here. So let's update the TS config to make sure that this file is included in the TypeScript and this folder is included in this TypeScript compilation process. All right, so now we've defined our component, we can use it. So in our Convex folder, this is, this is not the component. This is our own Convex folder for this project. Let's add a convex.config.ts file. And this time, instead of defining a component, we're going to use it. Cool. So now if we just type components dot, we should see our hello component. Very nice. 
We don't have anything on this yet, uh, obviously, as we've not written any mutations or queries. So let's just do that now. First, let's add a schema to our component. So let's create a schema.ts file in our hello component directory. And don't forget, because components are basically like little small convex apps, a component can define its own schema without worrying about conflicting with the, the application schema that it's going to be part of. So the schema is going to have a simple table hellos that's going to contain a list of hello world messages. And now let's create a mutation that's going to be able to push into that table. So let's create a hellos.ts file and pop in a simple mutation that pushes the message into the database. All right, so now let's pop back to our applications convex folder and use it. So at the bottom of our add number mutation, let's do context.run mutation and then components dot hello component dot hellos dot add hello and push in our message. Right, now let's take this for a spin. So if I click the add random number button now, we'll see our, we still get our random number pushed into the list. Um, but we don't see anything else on the screen. So let's have a look at whether the message is being pushed into the hellos table. Let's open up the convex dashboard with npx convex dashboard. We're going to go to the data tab. And then on this drop down here, we're going to change it from app to our component, our hellos component. And then we should be able to see our hellos table and all the data. Awesome. Okay, so now we've seen how quick it is to build your own simple component. I wanted to explore things a little bit more, so I took this simple Hello World project a little bit further and built this. It's a very simple messaging app. You can sign in, giving yourself a name, and then you can add a message. And then this is where the component part comes in. You can add a reaction to that message. And obviously, as this is a convex app, everything is synced automatically between multiple tabs and browsers. Each user can see the total number of reactions and whether they personally have reacted to this message. So I built this in almost exactly the same way as we just saw with the hello component. It's a sibling component that lives in the reactions component directory. We have a schema that contains table reactions that contains our reactions for a given piece of content from a specific user. Then in our convex.config.ts file, you'll notice that I'm pulling in a another component, the aggregate component, to keep track of the reactions count. Now, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but this might not be the ideal way of doing things. I'm kind of doing it just to, for a point for this demo. But the, the reason I'm doing it is because I want to show that components can contain components, which can contain components, which can contain components. So it's nested components all the way down. Then in our reactions.ts file, we have the actual queries and mutations that do the work. We have toggle reaction, which, as you might expect, adds a reaction or deletes it if the user has already added that reaction to this specific piece of content. Then we have get reactions for content and, and user reactions, bit of a mouthful, uh, which pulls in the reaction counts for a piece of content and also the reactions that this user has made for this piece of content. And finally, delete reactions for content, which ties things up if the user deletes a message. Oh, and we also have this reactions client here. Now, this is a common pattern that the team recommends when you are building non-trivial components. So although we could have the users of our reactions components use the context.run mutation and then passing in the components.reactions.reactions.toggle.reaction call, it's a bit verbose, I think you might agree. So to make things a little bit nicer for users of your components, it's recommended that you wrap it in some sort of client like this to make things access a little bit easier. So here, uh, you just need to define an instance of the class at the top once, and then I can call reactions.forContent, giving it the message ID, and then dot .toggle, which is much nicer, in my opinion. And um, yeah, I mean, that's just about it for this app. The, the front end um, calls into some queries and mutations in a comics directory as normal which then writes to their own database while also calling into the component to do something. And don't forget, because components are isolated private things to your application, the front end can't directly call into queries and mutations inside of a component. They must first go via your queries and mutations. So it's a, a wrapper and abstraction around the component. 
And the same goes for HTTP actions. Uh, external HTTP calls can't call directly into the component. They must first go via your um, HTTP actions, which then call into them. If you do want to expose HTTP actions from your component though, there is some documentation on it, which I strongly recommend you check out, but basically involves just re-exporting the actions from the component. Speaking about the docs though, there are a bunch of other stuff that I haven't covered in this video that are in the docs. And so I strongly recommend that you check out the docs before starting on writing your own component. One thing I think is especially important to understand is exactly how the component transaction boundaries work, as it might not be totally obvious at first what happens in the case of an error, what data gets rolled back, what data doesn't, etc. Oh, and one final thing, <laughs> after I had finished working on this script and working on this reactions component, a colleague of mine, Seth, informed me of this component they had written a couple of weeks ago. Look familiar? Yeah, yeah. It's another reactions component, except it's been implemented in a much better way than mine and is much more ready for production. So if you do actually need a reactions-like feature in your application, then I would strongly recommend that you check out this component and not mine. Alrighty then, so hopefully this has given you a good idea of what components are all about and how you can go about creating your own in basically no time at all. So now I did promise at the start a spicy take, so here it is. So after watching this, you should now know how easy it is to write components. So should you go off creating them willy-nilly for the various parts of your application? Eh, maybe not. I would say components are awesome if there are some really commonly used parts of a back-end development process like rate limiting or aggregates or AI agents or something like that. Outside of really large teams and projects, I would say the cost of breaking up parts of your application into smaller components is probably more cost than it's worth. Because there is a cost, not just added complexity as you split up your code like this, it's also in the fact that any call between your app and a component actually costs counts as an extra function call, which will count against your quota. So for in the case of my reactions component here, when we press a reaction to toggle reaction, we don't incur just one function call by running this mutation. We actually have another call into the component and then the component itself calls into the aggregate component. So in effect, we've now incurred three function calls instead of one. Now Convex function calls are cheap, so it's probably not a big deal, but something you probably should just be keep in mind should you start thinking about breaking up your application into lots and lots of little components. But having said that, there are still lots of situations where it is totally worth it. And there are lots of spaces for where components are useful. So to help kickstart the community around building components, we're running a component authoring challenge where you can build components for prizes. I have left a link to that challenge down below. So if you want to check out all the details, including a bunch of other links and uh, links to the, including the source code to the uh, reactions component that I built. So don't forget to check out the links down below. And while you're down there, you might want to help me out by feeding the algorithm. Drop me a comment. Let me know what kind of awesome component you're going to work on or you would like somebody else to build. And anyways, that's about it for me for today. If you like this video, you might want to check out this video I did a little while back on the aggregate, aggregate components. I can't say that word. Until next time, thanks for watching. Cheerio.